Okay. Um, all right. So I'll I'll just uh, dive in and get started. So this is um, uh, a bit of a combination of a, a methods talk and an application talk. I'm more heavily weighted towards the methods for um, modeling networks and um, kind of a discussion of of some of the strengths and benefits of of doing that using um, the so-called statistical approaches. Um, and so, yes, I'll be going for uh, about 25 minutes or half an hour, and I'm happy to take any questions. So um, I would say three broad questions that we could ask when we're interested in getting started in modeling networks or epidemics on top of networks are, how do contacts co-evolve with the epidemic dynamics? Um, how to conceptualize contacts in general um, in conspian network, and then what is the role of network data um, relative to the uh, epidemic simulations? So um, with regards to the first question, the, one of the key dividing points in modeling um, networks is whether we want to represent them as um, static or dynamic network models in general explicitly represent um, usually highly structured and repeat contacts between name agents over the time scale of the epidemic, and whether that's static or dynamic where the edges changing um, across nodes in the network is somewhat dependent on the um, time scale of the epidemic process relative to the time scale of the contact process. Um, for um, many infectious disease dynamics, we're interested in that relative uh, ratio for the contact duration to the to the disease duration and in some cases it could be less than in other cases it could be greater than um, and regardless of whether it's um, one direction or the other um, the uh, structure of the network um, can change over time and to understand some of the key network features including degree or the number of um, cross-sectional connections, the, the level of overlap, the duration and, and mixing within the network, um, we should at least investigate the, the role of temporality in networks and, and the evolution of the network structure over time um, with respect to the, the time scale of the epidemic and simply cross-sectional um, descriptors of the network structure may be insufficient um, because the network structure can change over time. And one illustration of this is to um, is the measure of the forward reachable path, which is this time structured um, progression of an epidemic over the temporal reachable um, set of connections that evolve over time that may not be present in any cross section, but are um, connected um, across the edges and, and over time. <clears throat> and these connections can can form kind of the epidemic potential um, for an infectious disease uh, dynamical process. Um, and they can also generate a level of heterogeneity in the transmission rate um, at the individual level um, that is much greater than the heterogeneity that might be um, present in any uh, representation of the network cross-sectionally. So for these, these reasons, you know, representing the network um, temporarily, or at least investigating whether to do so in different applications is important. Another related issue, um, if one chooses to represent the network dynamically, is the level of feedback or interaction between the network structure over time as it evolves, and then the epidemic structure or all the other exogenous processes that happen um, within this complex system um, that may have an impact on the network structure. So many um, dynamic network models for epidemics um, take the approach of uh, no feedback where um, the network is simulated from a series of time steps from one to n, and then we go back and simulate the epidemic on top of it. In reality, when um, there are massive changes to the, to the population structure over time as a result of things like disease-induced mortality or say behavioral changes to um, how people make their contacts in response to the epidemic dynamics, we need to do something like on the bottom where the network is re-simulated in response to the epidemiological and other exogenous changes over time. Um, but this gets tricky um, uh, technically. The second question 
that one must ask about how to represent and, and model epidemics on networks is, is what counts as a contact and whether to represent that um, between people or another method. Um, so the typical representation of transmissible contacts is uh, between people is something on, on the left where each node in the network is a, is a person and each edge is a contact between persons. And that's most useful um, and has a few assumptions when those contact processes are um, more easily measurable. Um, another approach, which um, my colleague Pavel Kravitsky is going to be talking about tomorrow, is a, a so-called bipartite network in which um, one set of nodes are people and another set of nodes are places and people form contacts um, with places, um, but no places form contacts with each other. Um, and so this is, this is another type of representation of the network that may be more helpful um, in many cases like coronavirus in which the um, contact process is more diffuse. Having said that, I'm going to mostly focus on um, the representation on the left um, in person-to-person -person contacts for today. And the third um, kind of framework or question that we have to ask when modeling networks is what's the role of, of data? And I think that this can span all the way from um, pure theory to pure data. And on pure theory, um, we've learned uh, quite a bit about the um, the, the theoretical understanding of how network structures um, can impact epidemic dynamics, um, you know, uh, starting with all the important findings um, from the last century, um, including uh, network structures like small world networks and, and how those kind of synchronize um, epidemic dynamics um, across populations um, over time, even if most of the even if most of the connections are structured. But these are, these are less um, data-driven models in the sense that they're not necessarily trying to represent any um, specific contact structure for any specific epidemic dynamic. On the other hand, we might um, consider a, a pure data network structure. Um, and I think that this is a, a, a good example of this where we go out and collect a bunch of data, and sometimes we might call this big data, and so this was a study that collected RFID data at a, at a scientific conference for two days, and then used all of that RFID data to simulate an influenza-like epidemic on top of that, um, that uh, network structure that was um, obtained based on the RFID data, or, or you know, spatial proximity formed network con connection. Um, but one of the issues of course, with this is the completeness of the of the network data that, that one gets if one is is taking the observed network um, from this type of data and inferring the overall population structure. So some of the inferences that are required um, happen across both space and time when we have these type of big data network data sets, and I think they're increasingly of interest for coronavirus with um, things like cell phone, cell phone data and um, other types of contact tracing data sets that are emerging today. Um, but some of the inferential questions that we have to ask when we have big data like this is what happens outside of the observed network if only a subset of the population participates in that data collection exercise. And this creates a, the kind of fundamental network boundary prop, um, problem where um, things like study participation or study eligibility or definition of the target population may create an artificial uh, definition or boundary of the network that may not correspond to the um, boundary that is obeyed by the pathogen of interest. The temporal inference that is uh, important to consider is what happens to the epidemic after the observation of the network stops. Um, you know, in the example I showed before, they measured the network for two days, but then simulated the epidemic for 60 days. Okay, so there's some sort of temporal inference that happens. Do contacts keep um, in the same state at the end of the measurement? Do we repeat the observations over and over again for the time scale of the epidemic simulation, randomly reshuffle them? The paper before it did a combination of, of all of those, um, but it's a, it's a question um, that concerns the inference of, of how we move from the observed census data for the network to the, um, the larger uh, network structure. 
So this really raises questions about inferences that we can get from a specific data set and often counterintuitively, the more network data that we collect, we call this big data, often results in greater assumptions, not fewer assumptions about um, the broader network structure. Um, the so-called missing data problem um, with, with network data really is a function of the dependence of the um, data structure of, of networks. So with independent data, if we don't sample a person in our study population, it usually doesn't affect the sampling of another person. And if, if one person doesn't respond to a survey question or we don't have the measure for them, it, it often doesn't affect another person's response. But with, with dependent data like network data, um, the observation or lack of observation of a particular person can fundamentally alter the, the observed properties of the network structure. Um, and this is shown in the little toy diagram on the right hand side where um, say the true network is between A, B, and C, and B and C are connected indirectly. And if we had failed to observe or sample A for whatever reason, um, we miss that indirect connection between um, B and C. So for networks, these missing nodes from our sampling result in uh, or imply missing edges. <clears throat> so I worked with um, a student here at Emory, Kristen Nelson, on exploring the implications of this missing network data structure on um, genomic data for tuberculosis, but this also, um, also plays a role in um, behavioral and, and survey data as well. So if, if true network census data um, have some issues or limitations for um, missing data, what are some broader generative approaches to, um, to representing network contacts? I would suggest there might be two broad classes here. One are agent-based models and another are statistical approaches that I'm going to be um, discussing more today. But agent-based models um, in general represent the um, network as an emergent property from local or dyadic decisions of agents. And these often source the data about the decision-making process on the local level from a collection of secondary data sources. Um, sometimes this involves representing the population with some synthetic um, population data that's informed with things like census data, um, but often with assumptions about um, spatial proximity and uh, social connections and how they actually generate the network structure from um, those data involves uh, you know, various um, algorithms. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, statistical approaches in, in contrast kind of take a top-down approach instead of a bottom-up approach instead and can represent the network from either a global or local representation, um, but use statistical models to provide an inferential link between those levels. Um, and because of that, um, they provide a little bit more flexibility in, in asking um, different questions and generating hypotheses about the social forces that could have generated the network as a more general um, property, and, but that often requires either more assumptions or more data or both. So there's no um, free lunch. So some of the um, algorithms that are often used within agent-based models are, are so-called stub matching algorithms that um, look something like this, you know, this, so this is an example from the um, sexually transmitted infection world um, where, you know, there's, there's, mix, there's sexual contact mixing between men and women and males line up in a queue and there's a certain probability of selecting a female partner in each um, bin that are categorized by age. And if a woman is available in the highest probability bin, a match will occur. Um, and if not, then um, they have to move on to the next highest probability bin. Um, and, and each male is then cycled through within um, this algorithm to, to generate a, a stub. Um, so from a kind of top-down network perspective, these agent-based algorithms look like this um, searching procedure where there's a kind of node in the center and he's um, searching for um, potential contacts that, that result in um, consistency with, you know, probabilistic assumptions that are encoded within the algorithms. Um, but one of the questions that a network scientist might have in, in looking at this bottom-up bottom agent-based model approach is whether the data um, or assumptions are simply a representation of spatial proximity or um, uh, really encoded into some measure of, of the data. 
with more and more local rules about what types of um, dyads are permissible or high probability, it's often not clear if the emergent global network will be um, realistic um, if it's formed um, simply based on this emergence. Um, and, and part of this is due to the inherent dependence of the edges. So a connection between say um, uh, person I and person J may have to um, be dependent on whether person I also has a connection with person K um, at the particular um, time point. Another issue is that there may be correlations within um, propensities for forming connections with um, any two people that um, are um, correlated in the sense that they may be explained away by um, correlated predictors, um, whereas agent-based models are often um, representing these only within um, with respect to marginal distributions. Um, um, and then a final issue or, or concern with these types of algorithms is that there's often an algorithm in quotes, you know, for contacts, you know, that's built around this highly structured model that's often challenging to abstract. And when um, there are challenges to abstracting the model, um, the types of questions that we can pose about the dynamic epidemic model um, become uh, trickier to model. We can't model counterfactuals, say, to the network structure itself if the underlying network structure is, is really hard coded into the um, system. So, one statistical approach to this is to use a, a general framework for um, a statistical representation of, of network models. And there, there are a variety of these, but one approach that um, my group uses are called um, ERGMs or exponential random graph models where um, we're modeling the probability of observing the network um, in our data as a function of a set of network um, statistics and associated parameter values. And we're using statistical models to estimate what those parameter values are um, inferentially. So um, what goes on the left-hand side of that equation is the data, so some representation of the network. And um, dynamic networks are, um, given that dynamic networks are often infeasible to measure with a full census due to the missing data issues that I mentioned before, um, we can use a sampling-based approach to um, measure and then input these data into these network models. Um, so uh, ERGMs, exponential random graph models, are statistical models, so they can use the sampling-based approach and, and one way to do this is um, with egocentric network data, where we go out uh, into the population and, and sample individuals, um, say the three nodes in the rectangle here, query them on um, attributes of, of themselves and attributes of their connections. And um, this can be done with a survey framework, but also can be done with other types of um, data as well, such as um, cell phone data or um, even potentially genomic data. There's a large set and a growing set of data sets available for this, but of course this depends on what um, the contact is. Um, and these are more easily characterized for uh, close types of contacts like sexual partnerships and friendships than they are potentially for respiratory contacts. So that's a potential drawback with this type of egocentric measurement approach. Um, on the other hand, if these primary data are not available, um, we can still input secondary target statistics that we can say source from the primary, uh, source from the existing literature um, instead and, and input those into the model. On the right hand side of the ERGM equation is um, some generative process that we're hypothesizing are the, the key elements of the um, formation of the network structure um, that could include things like the distribution of degree across the population, the uh, propensity for mixing across multiple um, attributes and some higher order level um, network structures like triangles or um, other types of clustering that may be measurable based on our available data. Um, but in their aggregate, these set of terms on the right hand side represent a multivariate set of um, of features that collectively define the network structure based on the available data that we have. Um, and once we have the, the data and have made this hypothesis about um, the structure of the network, we can put these together within um, an ergum 
um, based on the sufficiency of statistics that we can input the, into the ergam that, that represent the full probability distribution of um, this network structure. Um, with um, scaling as appropriate if, as we're wanting to move from our sample to the population level. So um, again, time is involved here. So we're not just doing this cross-sectionally, we're doing this um, in, in terms of two parallel processes in which um, there is a ergam for um, formation of new edges and another parallel ergam for dissolution of existing edges um, that evolve over time um, as we move from say time step one to time step two, these two processes are, are happening um, together. And we can have different components that go into the formation and dissolution formula um, uh, independently. Um, and these methods have been um, really formally defined and, um, and described by uh, Krivitsky and, and Hancock within just the past few years. So with a well-fit model um, that has good diagnostic properties, we can then take the model and simulate from it. The estimation um, algorithms within ergams um, use the simulation-based approach to estimating the coefficients, and, and then we can use those same um, estimation algorithms then to simulate the, the network structure forward as it evolves over time. So this um, plot here is just showing uh, four panels over 25 time steps of a little toy network um, to show how the edges are particularly changing over time um, with one focal node, node number 14, highlighted just to show that um, his connections um, are not, um, not, not, not necessarily static. Um, and with all of the statistical machinery for um, dynamic contact networks as they're evolving over time, we can then plug this into the key um, step within the dynamic um, epidemic model, which is the transition from susceptible to infected. So the, this network structure is really defining who um, contacts whom with respect to disease transmission. So instead of representing this as a um, single force of infection type of parameter or um, you know, a, a, a set of parameters within a um, differential equation model that may be structured by age. This is an individual level representation that's driven by how the network composition is, is changing over time. Um, so we formalized all of these methods um, within a, a software tool called EpiModel, um, which is an open source software platform for epidemic modeling in R. Um, that places epidemic dynamics on top of these temporal ergams um, within the statistical framework of, of StatNet. And this um, tool, this EpiModel tool, has both built-in models um, for some basic exploration and teaching purposes, um, but also has an extendable um, programming interface for research level um, modeling. So I'll refer you to our website there for more details. Um, but this package really sits atop of a large family um, or suite of software called um, StatNet um, that is um, providing general tools for the analysis, visualization, and statistical modeling of um, network data, not just for epidemic dynamics, for um, lots of other purposes too. And EpiModel kind of just sits at the top of the tree and adds the epidemic dynamics component to it. So moving into applications, um, our primary motivations are um, have largely been in the in the field of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, where where we have good data on network structure, and we can ask both empirical and interventional questions about um, the the how the structure of networks and, and in particular sexual partnership networks impacts um, the the transmission dynamics of these diseases, um, and also how we can optimally design. And prevention methods um, that respond to the network structure. Um, but there's been a growing um, interest and in, in use of EpiModel and the network-based models that underlie it for modeling um, lots of other types of infectious diseases, um, including by external researchers who have taken you know, this, this tool and um, added extra um, structure to the epidemic models, but use the same um, network infrastructure um, at the heart of it. And so I think in general um, for coronavirus and thinking about the applicability of this approach for um, respiratory infections in, in general, um, I think that this approach 
for network modeling can provide some unique insights into the transmission of these diseases um, under three general conditions. Um, so it's not necessarily, I'm not advertising this as useful for all possible epidemic models, right? Um, the, the, the three conditions I think are, are when the network structure, including the temporal pathways in particular, is central to the research question. Um, the network definition and boundaries are, are clearly defined um, which is often not the case for these large um, agent-based models or, you know, these huge metapopulation models um, that might be outside the scope of ERGMs. Um, and there's some rigor in the network data that's available for modeling. And so two of the current applications that I've been using um, these methods for, specifically for coronavirus, have been um, to understand transmission dynamics on, in ships and universities, which kind of meet these three um, conditions. So one of the um, in-progress models that I have going um, currently with uh, collaborators at, at Yale's, um, Saad Omer and, and others in his team, is to, um, uh, is to model the transmission dynamics of the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Given that there was a large-scale network lockdown and sectorization of the ship, um, that occurred after the initial outbreak of disease um, and the first wave of testing. Um, and so the goals with this model are first to fit the model to empirical data to see that we can re-represent um, the transmission dynamics on the ship and then to pose counterfactuals specifically related to the network structure to understand broader control strategies um, given the fact that um, these uh, cruise ships are going to begin operating again potentially um, later this year and other types of ship environments like on um, Navy fleets are um, continuing to operate currently. So to do so, we're representing um, the network structure with a so-called multi-layered dynamic contact network in which there's not just one um, ergum, but three that are overlapping. So they're representing um, the same set of nodes across all three networks, but the set of edges is different. And we're using that to allow for greater flexibility um, to represent the types of um, multi-level structure that occurs within the cruise ship environment. So guests within cabins, cabins within um, ship sectors, and then crew on the ships assigned to cabins within the sectors. Um, and then we have multiple ergons for pre-lockdown and post-lockdown of the network structure. Um, and some of the scenarios that we're exploring um, include the timing of the lockdown, the design of the sectorization of the ship, and um, changes to the degree, the network degree, and within cabin um, mixing constraints um, after the lockdown to evaluate the um, projected cumulative incidence under different scenarios. So we start with a um, model calibration where we're, where we're fitting um, some of the uh, epidemic parameters to the um, epi curve of diagnosed cases on the ship um, and incidents uh, on top of that, including undiagnosed cases, and then um, implementing different uh, counterfactual scenarios to evaluate um, what could have happened. Um, so some of the results um, that we have um, show that the timing of the lockdown um, could have had a dramatic impact on the um, cumulative incidence of disease. Um, but um, of course, it depends on, on the timing of the diagnosis of cases and the response as well. Um, and second, um, one of the other um, applications that we're using this modeling approach for is to inform the ap academic response, which um, is happening at my university and lots of universities around the world of um, what to do in the fall semester when the university is potentially opening back up, given the fact uh, that we have um, students returning to potentially returning to campus that have um, very close levels of, of contacts. Um, so we started with a an ODE type model um, that focused on mass screening and testing of symptomatic students and faculty. And we're then moving towards a um, network-based model where we're going to be representing um, contact tracing of um, diseases and, and evaluate the, the impact on um, disease dynamics there. Um, so there are some of the results from the screening. Um, and I'd just like to um, close and, and say that some of the ideas about contact tracing um, and what it's going to mean for coronavirus have pretty strong roots within um, the STI uh, 
control um, sphere within health, what health departments are doing. And um, some of this we've already represented within um, dynamic network models using um, uh, networks of sexual partnerships of um, men in the United States where we're understanding whether things like partner-driven prevention um, can be uh, adequate to control the, the incidence of bacterial um, STIs. Um, and part of what this um, modeling exercise has, showed us, has shown us is the level of, of um, steps that one has to go through in this flow diagram. Each one of these steps has to be successful as the um, patients are identified, their contacts are then identified, the um, medication is then provided to the contacts and, and so on um, to actually achieve um, disease prevention. So um, things are, are often more complicated, but we have the, the kind of broader framework for representing these um, contact tracing and other partner-driven um, prevention strategies. Um, so I'll just close and, and say that we have a, um, a short course that happens each summer uh, in August. Uh, in this year, it's happening August 17 to 21. And because of travel restrictions, we're, we're now offering a remote web-based option for this course. Um, that's taught by myself, Martina Morris, and Steve Goudreau, uh, called Network Modeling for Epidemics, where this is really focused on um, hands-on modeling with EpiModel and the StatNet tools um, with the focus on, on building um, applied models. So I encourage you to check that out at the link below um, if you have interest, and I'm happy to answer um, any questions. Thanks. Right, well, thanks very much. Uh, sort of feel that uh, it's a, uh, I think I want one of those for my birthday, you know, a sort of, sort of shiny epi model in a large sort of, so replace my old copy of Pandemic, which was the board game we played at the Newton Institute six years ago, and uh, and get get playing around with it, because I think there are lots of, you know, lots of questions I'd like to ask about these kind of models, and uh, maybe the way to ask those questions is to get one's hands on it and try things out. Anyway, do we have any immediate questions? And if you want to, if there, please either use your putting a hands up symbol or put something in the chat. Okay. Sorry, that's, um, we had a hand up, but there's no name attached. So I can't, uh, don't know why you haven't, sorry. Guy with the headphones, uh, John, John Pitcher, John. Just, thank you, that was fascinating talk. Uh, I, an ignorant question from an applied mathematician. What signal can I see in my data, for example in the Diamond Princess, that would lead me to believe that I need this kind of three layers of, uh, of contacts? You know, you're talking about crew to crew and crew to guests and so on. How would I know that that's the correct level of abstraction and not simpler or more complex? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. We were working from a kind of data-driven approach where these types of contacts were um, pretty well characterized in the post-network lockdown um, timing um, in which the, the passengers were isolated within their own cabins and um, you know crew were visiting the cabins on a daily basis and the number of those contacts and and the number of contacts of, of crew to other crew were relatively well characterized. And so I, I, I think in that sense, it's, it's driven by trying to represent um, some empirical, a mix of empirical data, an idea of how to abstract from that data um, into, the, into the models. I think that you could start with say one broader homogeneous um, population that isn't as structured but the multi-layer approach in this particular setting allows for some more fine scale tuning of um, the components that go into the um, formation and dissolution formulas um, over time for each one of those types of networks. Because the, say the contact structure for the crew changed in a different way than the contact structure for the passengers changed. Okay. Question. Uh, yeah. Question from 
Jamie Wood, I think, which is uh, how easy is it to generate networks to be statistically similar on average? Which network statistics do you prioritize? Um, <clears throat> so I'm not quite sure what you mean by statistically similar on average. Um, so there was a point on your slides where you said you generated similar uh, network statistics on average. And I've done some modeling myself, not in epidemic context, where it's surprisingly hard to do that because you can, if you like, you have to pin one type of statistic and then the range of other things that can change is quite wide. So actually generating, finding a mechanism for generating those networks becomes quite troubling. I just wondered how you've done that and if there's any details there that you might be missing. Yeah, so maybe I'll let my colleague Pavel Kravitsky, who is the mastermind of actually this, these algorithms, um, respond. Well, I wish I were the mastermind of these algorithms, but um, so the, the whole thing is, uh, well, okay, so there are two uh, uh, sources here. If we're dealing with static networks, it's done in the exponential family random graph model framework. And one property that exponential families have is that, in fact, when you fit their maximum likelihood estimator, the expected value of uh, sufficient statistics, which I'll talk about a bit tomorrow in my talk, they match those observed. So, uh, that, that, so in some sense, we actually have this automatic mathematical guarantee that if we fit a model to a particular set of network features, then that model will reconstruct those network features in expectation. Uh, and I'd be happy to provide a number of references for this. It's, uh, with respect to dynamic models, it's a little more complicated, but loosely speaking, we use a method called generalized method of moments estimator, where we actually essentially calibrate our parameters to match these statistics. And uh, in practice, because these models, in, in part because these models are based on exponential family random graph models, we can do a pretty good job of that, although it's much harder to prove. I hope that helps. Can I, could I make one comment there? Just to, yeah. to fill in. I think the, the key thing here is uh, that because you're jointly estimating these thetas, you're not estimating them marginally. So I think, Jamie, the kind of problem that people run into is if you try to fit first the mean number of contacts and then you go to the age mixing matrix and marginally you fit the age mixing matrix, you find that there are inconsistencies as you try to pin one of these things down, then the other one doesn't look right anymore. The whole idea behind this approach is you're jointly estimating all of the parameters at once. So once you've done that, all those intercorrelations among them are part of what is inferred from the estimation process through MC, it's an MCMC based algorithm for estimation but it's the statistical theory then from as as Pavel points out the exponential family uh, uh, theory that says once you've estimated the maximum likelihood values of these parameters these thetas if you simulate from that model in expectation, you will reproduce the sufficient statistics of the model. So it varies because it's a stochastic algorithm, it'll vary around, but you will be sort of sitting on this large multivariate space sort of in expectation right where the observed statistics are. So that's precisely the problem that it solves, which is one of the reasons why it's so attractive. But there, there could be yeah, in any real, any real application, there could be some structure to the network that you aren't acknowledging. That, and uh, I think a very interesting question is to think of ways of sort of stress testing your your network your, to see if it's actually like there might be some kind of little spatial structure in there. I mean, it's really quite difficult to tell whether if all you have is statistical information on on local contacts, it's impossible to tell whether you've got spatial structure there. In fact, so. Um, well, of, yeah, what, let me just point out, you can, space is something you can actually build into these models. So mm -hmm. it becomes a nodal attribute. And I think Pavel will talk about that a little bit yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, no, right. Okay, and a, so what you, in general, again, this is a statistical model. So we have methods for assessing goodness of fit. And there are many different ways of doing that that would be fascinating to talk about. But we do have ways of asking what I think is the fundamental question about goodness of fit, which is, if you've got these lower order processes, let's say some very simple processes, just a degree distribution and mixing on one particular attribute, 
if you simulate from that, do you reproduce other statistics, maybe higher order statistics of the network that you've observed? If you can reproduce those higher order statistics with the lower order processes, that suggests that at least the process you've hypothesized would reproduce these. It doesn't prove that that's the process that creates this network, but it's at least gives you a way of assessing consistency. So there's a whole set of methods uh, around goodness of fit for these models that we typically employ. Okay, so so I've got questions lined up. I think Jean Paolo first. No, I was just thinking about since this is a statistical method, that means that you can answer the first question whether you're happy with the context within all passengers or with special crew, crew, etc., by simply having information measures like a chi here Bayesian information measures between the likelihood since you have them either simulated or not so you can compare models and decide one seems better than the other or not and you obviously get you get significance values for the parameters right so you can see whether a particular process seems to have a role in structuring uh, the network or not hmm. you can test that hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so, okay, so we had uh, Istvan Kiss. You already intervened before, but uh, maybe you want to say just, something more. I just wanted to ask if you feed this in a sequential sequential way. Do you do you first feed the feed the network and then you run the epidemic on top, or everything goes in hand? Like, yeah. So the the steps for uh, running these models are first to. Um, is to fit the network model, to fit the temporal ergum, um, then diagnose it to make sure that it's a good fit, um, and then to run the um, epidemic simulation on top of it. But as I suggested towards the top of the slides, when we're running the simulation, then there's a feedback um, you know, between time step by time step, there's a feedback between the um, network structure changes in response to the exogenous processes um, but the, the model, you know, the underlying statistical model and the coefficient values remain um, constant. Did you, did you experience any correlations, for example, between uh, parameters of the network and parameters of the epidemic? For example, it's well known that if you have a dense network and a low transmission that can be confused for a sparse network with a high transmission. Yeah, so we haven't uh, we haven't um, incorporated those approaches at least for my um, COVID modeling, um, but that's something that could certainly be built in within um, within this framework. Um, hey. the, the the network data that we're or that we're fitting to, however, is is a reflection not of the of the transmission network. It's a it's a com it's a reflection of the underlying social contact network. Um, though, so that's that's one consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I can, can I translate that? Can I just translate that into our speak for a minute? Um, I think the the fundamental difference that I found over the years in in how to yeah. think about this is the way we distinguish that. I've done is we actually have data on the contacts. So when we're modeling the contact network, we're not even in a, to a certain extent we're not even looking at the transmission process at all. We don't get a single aggregate value of the say prevalence or incidence and then try to infer the contact network from that. We're inferring the contact network from itself. Okay, that makes right. sense, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Cla Claudio Strucina. Um, so it just occurred to me that since you have a dynamic network, this could also imply in uh, asking uh, counterfactual questions in a dynamic way. So we would have dynamic counterfactuals. Have you given any thought on that? Yeah, so one, uh, I guess I'd like to hear more about what you mean specifically about dynamic counterfactuals, but maybe one example of that is um, the, anal the quick analysis that I showed above, which was the timing of the um, network isolation. Okay, so this could be timed at a specific um, point, um, either in the timescale of the 
um, the contact process or the time scale of the epidemic process um, where the network structure uh, could be could be changed and that was actually what what happened on the diamond princess um, and we were trying to represent that maybe you mean something different by dynamic counterfactual so yeah so the idea that occurred to me is that you could um, elicit your counterfactual dependent on the previous path that you had in your network. I guess I'm not, I'm not entirely understanding, but. Um, no, it's okay. Like it's, a, it's a very yeah. fuzzy idea. Just, uh, uh, I just thought that you could have given in thoughts to that. Okay, so thank you. Claudio, if, if, can I take a stab at this? I'm not sure exactly what kind of process you're talking about, but it almost sounds like you're talking about a feedback between what happens in terms of the epidemic and then how that feeds back into a change in the way the network evolves. Is that, is that closer yes. to, yeah. Yes, I, ha I had vaccination in my mind. Right. And, okay. So, uh, yes, so, it's, it's along the lines that you that you just mentioned. Right. So, so there are two possible um, approaches to that. So, if the vaccination, for example, if makes the population aware that they no longer have to be as concerned about restricting their social contacts, then you could induce a correlation, and you would do that by having a a. a basically a nodal attribute for vaccination status, uh, that once somebody is vaccinated, their degree changes. That's just a very simple way of doing it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So once they are vaccinated, then they begin to behave differently. And as more and more people are vaccinated, the whole network structure changes as a result. So what is stable there is the coefficient that influences once you are vaccinated, how behavior changes, but it the impact of that stable coefficient varies in the aggregate network as the fraction of people who are vaccinated is increased. Does that sort of address your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you have any more questions? If we don't have any more questions at the moment, um, I suggest we take a 10 minute break and hope that the next speaker will start at near enough exactly three o'clock. So we'll see you then.